Okay, welcome back. Sorry, I clicked through the title slide, so I apologize for that. Uh, today, we are going to talk about microbial diversity. So some of the plagues we're going to talk about, you need to understand what is the organism causing them. So uh, we're going to talk about some of those organisms today. We're also going to talk about a little bit about microscopy, which is our first topic. So you remember that Robert Hooke had the first compound microscope, and his microscope is you know, the precursor and similar to what we use today. So on the left-hand side there, you can see a regular compound microscope, which is typically used in uh, laboratories all over the world. And you might even have one in your high school lab. Uh, but basically it has an ocular lens and an objective lens, just like Robert Hooke. The ocular lens, if it were 10, the objective lens, if it were 100, would create a magnification of about a thousand times, um, the, which is good. But then the electron microscope, which is on the right, is um, really amazing. It's uh, it's it it can do very fine detail uh, of tiny tiny images. Um, so we talk about magnification, and of course the electron microscope has magnification much greater than compound microscope or regular light microscope. But it has another feature, and that is the resolving power. So resolving power is the ability to see separate points. So if you think of like a pixel, a, a, a image, you might have enlarged at some point and pretty soon it gets so much bigger, you can't really tell what's in it. There's not enough pixels in it for you to see. Well, resolving power is the same thing. If you have low resolving power, then it's gonna look like that pixelated document. If you have high re resolving power, then you're gonna see uh, a much better image. <clears throat> so like an image might have 1200 DPI, that's much better than a 300 DPI or dots per inch for um, you know, an image on the web. All right, so limits of resolution. The naked eye can see about the size of a human hair. So if you just pull over a, or pull out a human hair, you can kind of see that it's, you know, it's very small, but you know, our eyes are very good and can pretty much see that. We can't see much smaller than that though. So then we bring in the light microscope and the light microscope is able to see images all the way up to uh, about one micrometer, uh, which is about the size of a bacteria. So we can see things from you know hair to pollen, to blood cells, to bacterium in that range. And then the electron microscope, we can see things up to about one nanometer, which is, or, or even, a little bit higher, one picometer, which is 10 to the negative 10. So if you think of a meter um, and you put over 10 zeros, then that's that's where we're at. Uh, so very, very small and with great resolving power. So that's what makes it useful to us. So magnification, just a review a little bit, magnification is the ability to make small objects seem larger. But resolution is the ability to distinguish two objects from each other. And this is what I talked about, the pixelated image. We kind of have one right here. And in the top on the left-hand side is good resolving power. The right is poor resolving power. But in this particular image, they're both, they both look fine. They're, they're per perfectly fine. The next image down you can see the image on the right is starting to get a little blurry. So the resolving power is not quite as good. And then on the final image down below, uh, you can see that the resolving power on the left is really good where the resolving power on the right is actually very poor. We can't really even tell that that's a nose unless we had seen it before. And we might not be able to tell that the one on the left <coughs> was a nose, but certainly we can see more detail. And then it's found on the picture of the right. We can see kind of the uh, the lines, the curves, if you will, of the dog skin texture, and then the line down the center where none of that is visible, the picture on the right. So this is what I talked about with the pixelated pictures. Um, over on the left-hand side, we see a tiny little globe or image of the earth. And then when we magnify it, and these are both the same magnification level or you know how we've increased the image size, uh, these are both the same, but the one on the left has poor resolution or very few pixels. And the one on the right has much better resolving power or more pixels per inch. So that's just the difference. And it's important to know that the difference of, of microscopes. So light microscopy uses a visible light, uses a glass lens, and the 
the advantage of this over an electron microscope is that we can actually put living things on it and view them in their natural state. So we can see them digesting food or we can see them moving. Um, so, so that's important sometimes if you wanna see what an organism is actually doing in, in their life. Uh, but light microscopy has limits to resolution and magnification. There's only so good you can make uh, that piece of glass into um, an objective or into an ocular lens. The electron microscope, though, can in, in, enlarge things to um, great, great magnification and it has really good resolving power. And that's because we use electrons rather than light. Electrons are just super tiny. <laughs> uh, and what they do is they, um, the electron beam hits uh, the sample and then the sample scatters those electrons and some x-rays off. And then when those bounce onto like a plate, it creates an image from those electrons bouncing off it. And then we view that on a computer screen or on a picture. Um, and uh, that gives us our image. So in these images, these are electron microscope images. You can see on the left, there's some pollen and you can see all those little spiky things. Well, that's what makes you sneeze because they are kind of spiky. Um, and then uh, in the middle, we have some cellular or circular DNA from bacterium. So pretty cool that you can see bacterial DNA in a microscope. And then over on the right, I think that's an ant. I'm not sure, <laughs> but uh, it looks kind of gross, like it's something out of a alien science fiction horror movie or something. Uh, but you can see what great detail uh, we have on that image. If you look at uh, some of the antennae up there, you can even see the little hairs that are protruding and those have got to be very small. And then here again on the left is some more pollen. And then on the right is that same creature. I think it's an ant, as I said, And but in this case, he's holding a computer chip. So I didn't know computer chips were that small, but apparently they are. I guess they have to be if they're gonna fit in your phone. Um, and this is a nice little animation, which I will post the link to this website uh, on the, the Canvas webpage. But um, for the time being, let's just take a look at it. And, um, Okay, is it going? Yeah. So all you want to do is click start the animation. And this is going to show us what, uh, how big some things are. Oops, what's going on? Hold on a minute. Let's try this again. Okay, much better. All right, so here we see a pin. And that's pretty much all we can see in this particular image. Um, the magnification or the, the size of this is about 20 millimeters. Okay? And it's at one magnification. So this is just kind of where we are. That's our naked eye. Then if we increase the magnification on it, sorry, that's kind of noisy. Um, if we increase the magnification on it, we can see that it is, uh, there's something else on there. And that is actually a human hair. And now we're down to two millimeters. Now, if we look at it, we can see something else even that is right there on the tip of the, or the head of the pin. And uh, that will increase the magnification. This is 10 times. So now we're at about 50 times magnification, 75, 80. And then there we can see that that is a dust mite. So kind of small, kind of yucky when you think about them around your house. Uh, <laughs> and so vacuum. Um, then there's also something really small, a really tiny dot there. So let's increase the magnification on that dot for that thing. Okay, so look at what we have here. It's not just one thing, it's actually several things. The large yellow thing is ragweed pollen. The circular object on the left that's kind of larger, that's a lymphocyte or a white blood cell. On the right is a red blood cell. And then in front of those two are baker's yeast. Now, you would think that would be as small as we can get, but let's just check it out. Okay, not done yet. Okay, so these are bacteria, the kind of round uh, yellow ones. Those are uh, coxibacteria, that's just round bacteria. And the little ones on the left are called um, bacilli bacteria. So two types of um, bacteria. Let's go down a little further. Oh my goodness, there's something else there. Okay. That is actually Ebola virus. That this kind of um, shepherd's hook shaped item. It's pretty big virus. You know, if you look at it compared to bacteria, it is quite small compared to the bacteria, but it's much bigger than the viruses we're gonna see. So these 
are actually rhinoviruses. And these are the ones that cause the common cold. So if you think of how small these particular organisms are, how easy it is to get infected, that's why we get colds all the time. Now let's just go out and see how, uh, how, how, how small they truly are. Okay, so there we've got Ebola. Those rhinoviruses are disappearing like crazy. Here's the bacteria. Here's the red cells, the yeast cell, the white cell, the pollen. You know, those are so tiny compared to even this. And then if we go keep going, we get all the way back to that dust mite, to that human hair, and then finally to the pin. So those things are so small. So, and that's why people get infected because they are so small. You know, we think that, okay, we cover our mask for some dust. Well, they are so much smaller than dust. So um, anyway, that's that's part of the problem. <laughs> All right, so again, I'll post this on, uh, on Canvas. So let's talk about the microbes that we're gonna use talk about in the course, which are from largest to smallest. So the largest are going to be the helminths, and these are worms. The worms are oftentimes visible to the naked eye, but their, their eggs are microscopic. These organisms are multicellular, and we'll talk about this later, but they are eukaryotic cells. So eukaryotic cells are the more complex cells, just that's for now. The next largest would be the fungi, and these are complex organisms, multicellular. You've probably all seen, you know, you if you bake, you might have even used yeast. Um, and so that's used in rear and bread making. Uh, and also there's some uh, uh, yeast that's used for, you know, other, other kinds of uh, things. So the fungi also have, well, here on the left of this square picture, we can see um, yeast, they're budding yeast. They, those are actually single cellular, uh, except they bud and they create a second cell. On the right-hand side of the same picture, we can see mold. And those are um, the, the kind of strands are what we call hyphae. And then the seeds, if you will, or the spores uh, are the blue objects that are up at the top. So some of these are visible with the naked eye and some are microscopic. Over on the right-hand side, you can see um, the blue picture, uh, which is a light microscopy picture. And that, <clears throat> excuse me, is actually penicillin. So that's a penicillium fungus, fungus, which penicillin is made from. And here it is again. This is penicillium, which is a fungus. And here it's growing on an orange. So not, not where we'd probably get it from. And this is it, it's so pretty. Uh, uh, of course, this is a colorized image, but uh, still pretty image. The blue dots on the top are the spores. So that's what's going to fly off of those hyphae. And that's what will be infectious as it floats around in the air. And this is another fungus and it's called rhizopus. And rhizopus puts, um, has black um, spores up at the top, which is why you see kind of a blackish color here. The hyphae go down into the bread. So you can see this here, uh, this image, you can see the hyphae, they call them rhizoids in this particular um, fungus because it's called rhizopus. So it has rhizoids that kind of are like roots and bury into it. And then you can see the black spores there being released to go infect more bread or more humans or whatever happens to be around. This is rhizopus um, in, uh, on the left, a light microscopic view. You can see the spores that are detaching from the spore head. And then on the right-hand side, you see the first image A, which is the spore heads. B, there's three or four of them. And then picture B is um, the spore head magnified even closer. And on C, even further closer still. And then on D, you can actually see the actual little tiny spores that will be released. <coughs> All right, and I mentioned yeast is typically singular, uh, single cellular. Uh, it does bud like it's showing right here. And that's used to make beer and bread. So a lot of microorganisms, are really great. We have used them for centuries to do all kinds of things. Uh, and overall, most bacteria are really great and most fungi are really great. There's just a few out of the millions of species of microorganisms that are pathogenic to us. So we're very lucky in that regard. And we've been able to capitalize on some of their uses. 
So this is a protozoa. So that's the next category. We talked about helminths, which are the biggest. Then we go to fungi and then we go to protozoa. And you probably all have seen this in your high school biology class or even your college chem college biology class. This is a paramecium. And uh, protozoas are complex organisms and they're typically single celled. Uh, these that you see here are common to pond water protozoa. So when I talked about Anthony Van Leeuwenhoek and his little simple microscope, these are the things that he called animacules. Um, they're, they're just little tiny organisms. One called stentor, has a trumpet shape, and then amoeba you've all seen. And euglena is kind of the, uh, it's, it's similar to a paramecium, except it has chlorophyll. So it actually uh, is similar to a plant in some respects. So there are some disease causing protozoa, and one in particular is malaria. So that is a protozoan, and you can see the circular image that shows the a blood cell that has been infected with the protozoa. Over on the right, you can actually see inside the cell, and that is <clears throat> that is the protozoa that we see kind of in purple. So good magnification there. And that's an electron micrograph, which has been colorized as well. Oh, this is, I don't need to do that. <laughs> All right. So um, now we're going to talk about cells that are called prokaryotic. So the cells we just talked about are all eukaryotic, which are more complex. They may be singular or multicellular, but they are more complex cells, which is why they're bigger. Uh, more complex organisms have more complex cells. But prokaryotic cells are the ones you may be familiar with for many disease-causing uh, substances or organisms. So prokaryotes are single-celled, and they are bacteria or they are archaea. And I'm just going to mention archaea. You don't need to know anything about these, but they resemble bacteria under a microscope, but they're very different from them. And these guys live in crazy places. Like if down in the uh, deep sea, there are deep sea vents where the temperature, you know, it's like right at the earth's core or whatever, um, you know, goes through the crust or whatever. Um, and those temperatures might be 700 degrees. And these bacteria like to live there. That's their temperature. So it's like us going to Hawaii. They love there. Um, and so anyway, the archaea live in very extreme environments. So either very hot, very cold, very salty. Anyway, don't need to know about that. I just think it's fascinating. All right. So then the other prokaryotic organisms are, are bacteria. And these we do know about. And these do cause diseases of many kinds. So they are single-celled. And there are so many living in your gut. There are between 300 and 500 different kinds of bacteria that live in, not in your stomach, but more in your intestines. And they're very good. They help us because they help provide some uh, vitamins. They help to digest some foods that we can't digest. So they're, they're very, very helpful. E. coli and bifidobacteria are two common species in our gut. Uh, then on our skin, we have organ bacteria as well. The most common one is an organism called Staphylococcus epidermidis. Obviously epidermis, that makes kind of sense. So uh, anyway, it's this round bacteria and it's very common, doesn't hurt you at all, just kind of lives there. And actually it's kind of good because when the bacteria, good bacteria are living there, that means the bad bacteria can't get through and in, infect us. So microbes serve a purpose, not only in like the stomach where they provide vitamins, but they can also provide a great deal of protection. Uh, but there are bad bacteria. And one is salmonella. You've probably all heard of that. And this is a picture of it. Uh, it doesn't typically cause pandemics. It might cause outbreaks in a certain area if like, you know, your local buffet uh, somehow got infected with salmonella, but typically not plagues. Then we also have some uh, viral and freon diseases or plagues. And these little guys are acellular. To me, they are like, I was telling my daughter this, they're like zombies because they're not dead and they're not alive. Um, they're acellular, so they have no cells and they're not really living because they need to invade you in order to use your machinery to create more of them. So I don't know, they just seem like zombies to me. Um, anyway, 
they are only visible with an electron microscope. And in the case of prions, those were only discovered, uh, gosh, I think it's been probably close to 20 years now. But um, yeah, we didn't even know about them. We thought viruses were the smallest infectious particle, but no. And you know what? Prions may not even be the smallest still. You know, there are diseases that are still unknown. So it could be there's something else out there. So non-cells, viruses. Viruses are an infective agent that are typically made up of a nucleic acid, either DNA or RNA, and they have usually have a protein coat surrounding it. They are much too small to be seen by the naked eye or by light microscopes, so we can only see them via electron microscopes. And as I mentioned, these zombie creatures are only able to multiply when they get in and affect your cell. They took, take over all your machinery and they use all of your chemicals and minerals and your your ability to to make things and then they make more of themselves and then they explode from your body and infect someone else Ugh. so this is a picture of ebola virus we saw that on the cells alive how big um this is a really bad bad virus don't want to get that one ever uh so this is a computer image of a rhinovirus which is the common cold virus and what's surrounding it inside is that DNA and RNA, but this kind of spiky stuff all around it, that's actually the protein coat. And that's called the capsid or the capsule. Um, and so that's, that's what surrounds the nucleic acid. It's protecting nucleic acid because nucleic acid is subject to ultraviolet radiation and heat, cold and some of that stuff. So it's gotta have something on it to allow it to hang around in the air and <laughs> infect us. Uh, so most viruses are very host specific. For instance, the image on the top uh, looks kind of like a spider with um, a tree on it. <laughs> I don't know what else to say, uh, but that's actually called a bacteriophage and that is a bacterial virus. So that, bac that virus will never infect us. It's very specific to bacteria and probably even to a specific type of bacteria. And then the lower picture, you can see all of those bacteriophages just trying to infect that poor bacterial cell. Anyway, there's many, many kinds of viruses for plants, for animals, for humans, etc. Viruses, as I mentioned, they get into our cell, they take over our machinery, they take over um, and they put in their DNA instead of ours. And that's what allows them to use our machinery to manufacture themselves. And our little cells become a virus factory. So this is virus shapes and sizes. And this is for kind of comparison. You can kind of see that red thing on the right of only a partial bit of a human red blood cell. Now, I don't know if you've ever bled, <laughs> probably have, but you know, blood cells are really small and you can't see them really with the naked eye at all. Um, so you can tell that these are very, very small. E. coli is the larger oblong, um, kind of purplish looking thing. You can see it's chromatin or it's DNA kind of hanging out in there. But then the rest of these are viruses and uh, they're all very, very small. Uh, Ebola is actually one of the larger ones. And then um, rabies is actually another pretty big one, but rhinovirus and poliovirus are super, super small. So easy to transmit. So how does a virus use and then kill a cell? Well, this is just a general overview. Step one, the virus gets into the cell. Step two, the virus replicates or duplicates itself using our machinery. And then as I said, it explodes out of us and goes on to infect lots of other poor victims. Ugh. All right, we have another acellular or non-cellular uh, infectious agent, which is prions. And prions are an infectious particle made of protein. And what they do is they get into our body and then they cause our normal proteins to misfold like them. And by doing that misfolding, it, it uh, creates a disease. It, uh, you know, the proteins can't work. And so when we don't have those proteins, then bad things start to happen. They don't contain nucleic acid. So they don't have any DNA. They don't have any RNA. And they're smaller even than the DNA or RNA that's inside that capsule of a virus. So they're super small. And these are the things that they discovered caused mad cow disease, or in humans, it's called Crutzfeld Jakob disease. But anyway, mad cow disease. And if you eat contaminated beef, then those proteins get inside you and they will cause you to, 
you know, have some effects on your brain, the proteins in your brain start to misfold. And then you have trouble walking, speaking, doing lots of normal human functions. So bad guys also. So the human body has about 30 trillion human cells, but it also has about 39 trillion. And I've heard this number up to 90 million, 90 trillion microbial cells, including bacteria, viruses, and fungi. So they're all over us. They're all over everybody, all over every surface. They're, they're just you know ubiquitous around everything you do and touch. And like I said, most of them are good. So we don't have to worry about them. Some of them are bad, but more than half of you really isn't you. So <laughs> it's kind of a shocking fact, but um, anyway, we, we all uh, carry around a lot of them on us, in us and around us. All right, and as I mentioned earlier, many microbes are really good for us. So in the nose, um, they if they're in your nose, they can, um, uh, uh, produce antimicrobial chemicals. So some of them actually help us in that regard, the, the good ones. Uh, and then in the mouth, they might help with digestion. And because there's many in there, they will crowd out any pathogens. They're in the lungs and they help to lubricate pulmonary tissues. In the stomach, they prevent gastric complications. In the colon, they digest complex carbohydrates. Sexual organs, they help to maintain pH and um, uh, hydrogen peroxide, some of them produce hydrogen peroxide, which kills microbes. And then on the skin, they fortify our immune system by, you know, like I said, crowding out any, uh, any bad, bad guys. And they produce scent. They're, they're in there in your sweat glands, around your sweat glands and all of that. So they produce some scent. And actually, some of them are actually used to produce uh, like perfumes and stuff, if you can believe that. Microbiology is weird. <laughs> all right, so symbiotic relationships. This is what we have with all of those bacteria, viruses, fungi, etc. Symbiosis is a close relationship between two species in which at least one species benefits. So in the case of our good bugs, both species are benefiting. But let's talk about the three basic types and that will come up. So the three basic types of symbiosis are mutualism, commensalism, and parasitism. So mutualism is a symbiotic relationship in which both species benefit. So that's kind of like our skin or our gut. You know, the like let's just take the gut for example. They're helping us to digest some organ, some some nutrients and absorb them. Uh, but we're giving them a ready food source so they get to keep growing and reproducing. So that's both of us benefit, both benefit. Commensalism is a relationship in which one species benefits, but the other species is not affected. Okay. So that means something like, um, well, let's just take our skin. I mean, even though it does help us to a certain extent, you know, the bacteria are just living there. So it's, it's neither, it's, it's kind of moot, but parasitism is a symbiotic relationship in which spe one species uh, benefits, but the other is harmed or not, you know, not necessarily killed, but may be harmed. Um, and in some cases they are killed. So let's look at another example. All right. So here we have mutualism at the top, both species organisms benefit. And in this case, I've just shown a sea anemone and a clownfish. And the clownfish and lives inside the sea anemone. And both of them benefit from uh, defense. Each one protects them from different um, predators. So the clownfish can hide in the sea anemone. And by the clownfish being there, it will eat <coughs> or scare away other fish that might want to eat sea an enemy. So commensalism, uh, one benefits and one is null, doesn't get any advantage or disadvantage. In this case, I have said uh, barnacles and whales. So the barnacle gets a free ride to all the great feeding grounds in the world, uh, but the whale doesn't even know anything. It just kind of gets rough skin. <laughs> they don't know that they're there and they don't, they're not harmed in any way. And then we have the bad type, which is parasitism. So in this case, one species benefits and the second bee, uh, organism is harmed. And in this case, this is a tick. So a tick jumps onto your dog and feeds from your dog. 
um, the host has to stay alive in order in order for the tick to survive. So the animal can get anemic or they can get irritation, but they're not actually killed by the parasite. There are some parasites, however, that, that will kill you in their relationship. All right, so that's it for microbial diversity. And this is just a sweet little joke. So uh, let me know if you have any questions and I will see you at my next lecture. Thanks for listening.